All right, yeah, hey everyone. So I'll be talking about June, the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, which we've already heard about today. Uh, Roberto gave a nice talk this morning, uh, diving into some of the details on the GPU-based detector simulation uh, that was developed for Dune. And so I'm gonna give a higher level and briefer talk uh, on our overall workflow and how we make use of the facilities that NERSC provides. Uh, to start with, I'll just give a brief review of physics and experimental design of DUNE. So DUNE is a neutrino experiment. Uh, neutrinos are these really interesting fundamental particles. They're really hard to detect because they just kind of fly through everything uh, and they transform into different other types of neutrinos among themselves, uh, which is a behavior that can provide some interesting insights on the laws of the universe. Uh, they could explain why there is more matter than antimatter. In fact, why there's almost no antimatter left over since the Big, Big Bang. Broad potential discoveries. Uh, is a accelerated neutrino experiment, which means that there is a beam of neutrinos produced, uh, in this case, at a facility in Illinois. Uh, and those neutrinos then travel underground first to a near detector complex uh, nearby, and then hundreds of miles away to South Dakota set of massive jumbo jet size detectors a mile underground uh, in a former gold mine. Uh, so the goal of doing all of this is primarily to search for something called CP violation, which is essentially a difference between matter and matter, in this case neutrinos and antineutrinos, because uh, that could explain this asymmetry that I mentioned. Uh, another important uh, goal is to determine which of the two neutrinos are the lightest, which one is the heaviest, because we don't know two possible order, orderings was actually the one obeyed by nature. Uh, and then there's all kinds of other physics that can be done, uh, supernova, solar neutrinos, and so on. So that's Dune. Uh, and I'll be talking specifically about the Dune near detector. Uh, and there are components that make up the near detector complex. The one I'll be talking about is so-called ND-LAR. Uh, that stands for near detector liquid argon. And this is a liquid argon time projection chamber. It's pixelated, and I'll explain what that means in a second. Uh, the important thing about using a liquid argon near detector is that the far detectors are also liquid argon, which allows to constrain a lot of systematic uncertainties using the, the, the near detector since they use the same target material. Uh, okay, so let's talk about time projection chamber. So let's imagine the charged particle goes whizzing like this. Uh, in that case, if it's moving through, say, liquid argon, it'll produce a tract of ion electrons in flake. And then she's got an electric field, say going into this screen, then those ions and electrons will drift towards a readout plane. In this case, it is a plane of pixels, and that's what they call this a pixelated detector. Uh, so this little skyscraper thingy is one module, and within this module, you have two sets of planes on either end that read out the charge that gets drifted, and this way you get three-dimensional images of fundamental particle interactions. Projection chambers don't use pixels like this, they use arrays of wires. Uh, in that case, you get a 2D projective readout instead of a true 3D readout, which is fine uh, in certain cases, but not for the near detector, as I will show in a second. Uh, this pixelated readout technology was actually designed here at El uh, and one of the challenges was making it work in a cryogenic environment, so it was sort of a first to demonstrate that that can be done, and it's what enables this detector to actually do its job. Um, there will be a bunch of these modules, these skyscraper little modules, uh, installed in a grid in this near detector, and that cube, that board cube you see right there, is what we get when we stack all these up. So, uh, in the far detector, we can see the fire readout, and you can see here a, sort of a skeleton of how massive that thing is. Uh, it really doesn't do it justice to how big those detectors are, but in the far detector, uh, we have a neutrino interaction from the beam. The event will look like this. You know, you get one interaction, basically, because interactions are so rare at such a large distance from the beam source. In a near detector, on the other hand, you get a huge mess of stuff in the detector. This is what you might read out, and then this, is my, this might be what you try to reconstruct. And so within one of these bolts, you get, say, dozens of individual particle interactions and other stuff flying out from the surrounding rock. So you have to disentangle that, and that one area where GPUs come in Another area is simulating the detectors in the first place. You have all these millions of channels from individual pixels, and so that's the type of problem that lends itself really well to parallelization on GPUs. 
And so that's why NERSC is coming in really handy for us. Um, so the uh, time frame for this has been accelerating because we have in the near future a prototype being deployed at Fermilab. This is the so-called two by two prototype where prototype individual modules will be put into a two by two array and installed in liquid argon and they will receive neutrinos from a beam at Fermilab. And this will actually be the first neutrino data that uh, Fermilab takes. Even though this, this demonstrator is a lot smaller than the lie detector, uh, density of uh, charge interactions within the material is expected to be about the same. So a lot of the computational challenges and reconstructing events are going to be the same between this demonstrator and the full-scale NDLR detector. Uh, okay, now I'll get into the nitty-gritty a bit uh, of the computing stuff we've been doing. So we've set up this simulation chain, which is essentially a bunch of different software products stitched together. Centerpiece that you heard about this morning is the so-called R&D sim piece, which takes charge in the detector, uh, makes the response of the detector to it, drifting the charge across the liquid argon, inducing a current on the pixels, reading those out, and so on. But before that step, we have the initial uh, simulation of neutrino interactions, uh, propagation of those particles that come out of those interactions through matter. That's all done on CPU. Then after we get the detector simulation on GPU, some calibration of that going to real data, uh, that's done on CPUs. And then we go back to GPUs for doing reconstruction. That's a so-called machine learning reconstruction or ML RECO. Uh, we have other reconstruction algorithms that run on CPUs. Then all that goes into analysis files. So that's the bird's eye view of our simulation reconstruction and analysis chain. We heard about Lauren DSIM this morning. I uh, won't be talking much more about that. And then here's just a eye candy slide learning reconstruction. Uh, you can see it uses neural networks um, and has pretty good performance and is an active area of research over at Slack. Uh, and now we'll talk about our workflow and how we've set that up. Uh, so we implemented this at NERSC on ProMod by driving this chain of programs by a bunch of back scripts. We have set those up to be controlled entirely by environment variables, instead of things like command line options or config files. Uh, the reason for doing it that way was to ideally make it easy for various uh, production and workflow management systems to wrap these scripts uh, without any further modifications to the scripts themselves. Uh, for our uh, prototyping uh, and initial uh, efforts on standing up this chain, we've been using the so-called Fireworks Workflow Manager. Uh, which is one that is recommended on the NERSC website. Uh, working pretty well for us. Uh, easy to learn, Python, DB, YAML, uh, technology that's pretty simple. Uh, we've been using SPIN to host the Mongo database that Fireworks requires, and that's been working great for us. Uh, in terms of job and scheduling, the way we do it, it we'll submit a job on some number of nodes, uh, and then there'll be one slurm task per CPU or GPU, depending on what type of workload we're running. And each task and pull work assignments from the Fireworks database, run them, and then continue until it runs out of wall time. Uh, at some point in the future, the same workflow will be centrally managed using the existing Dune production uh, tools. So in that case, you might submit a campaign from Fermilab, and then the idea there for the job to get submitted to NERSC remotely, and everything would proceed from there. Uh, we've been using containers pretty heavily in our workflows. And in fact, we've managed to use all four of the um, predominant container runtimes, uh, which is not a situation that we hope will continue, but that's how it's been so far. Uh, what we're doing is we're using Singularity, aka Aptainer, to build containers on our laptops. We then convert those to Docker, Docker Hub, and then pull them into Shifter here on NERSC. And that works fine, it's just a pain, especially building a container on your laptop. Um, so now that NERSC has provided support for Podman, that's been great. It's really nice to be able to build containers directly on Perlmutter. Uh, and uh, process of switching to that in the near term. Uh, we're also looking into using uh, the so-called CERN virtual memory file system, which is this distributed file system used for making uh, software available to the wider high energy physics community and other communities. Uh, and if you deploy your software to MFS, then in theory, any uh, compute node at any facility that plugs into CVMFS can run that software 
You don't have to manually ship software around. So we're looking into that as well. And there are some hybrid approaches where you can take a container, unroll it on CVMFS, and then load that container on any facility that supports CVMFS and a suitable container runtime. Um, so yeah, speaking of which, portability uh, is a goal. We want to be able to run this workflow at any facility that provides so primarily GPUs, so not just NERSC. Uh, so there have been some initial forays in that direction. Um, some collaborators have had some success running the same workflow at Argon, uh, including the CPU and the GPU steps. Uh, this have helped. The fact that different facilities have different container runtimes is a bit of a pain. Uh, but able to convert between these different formats pretty easily. And so in this case at Argon, they use Singularity, uh, and that's been working fine. At NERSC, uh, we've been making use of a bunch of the great services that NERSC provides. So SPIN, as I mentioned, has been really great. Uh, it's been hosting the Mongo database that we use for the Fireworks Workflow Manager. Uh, we also use it for hosting interactive event displays. Uh, we expect it to come in handy for data quality monitoring and so on as we begin operations. Uh, the web portal, which is just where you put a file in a certain directory on CFS and it becomes accessible to the web. That's been really useful for making data files uh, available to collaborators, without making them go through the motions of getting a NERSC account. If you want to look at a you know a single data file. It's been really handy. Uh, Jupyter service has been great for doing interactive analysis. Um, data transfer nodes have provided very rapid transfers of all these simulation outputs to Fermilab for further analysis there. And as I mentioned, CVMFS access is nice to have. Uh, it will enable us to share our software within the wider Dune collaboration in a very easy way. So all these things have been really great for us. And so to wrap up, um, just say thank you to NERSC for providing the uh, mother and all the tech support for the services that have come in very, very handy. In fact, they've been essential in standing up the sim simulation chain. Uh, from this point on, we look forward to further development. So hope to integrate this workflow into the official Dune production pipeline, including remote submission of NERSC jobs from, from off-site. Uh, we hope to other steps into the centralized workflow. So reconstruction uh, is the main one. Uh, like to make this workflow run at other facilities and expand it to the full NDLR detector uh, on this two by two prototype. So thank you. Okay, one and two. <laughs> I'm sorry. But they mentioned there's some Yeah, so co-scheduling of CPUs and GPUs is a really interesting problem, and we don't do anything very fancy. So the steps that do not use GPUs, like the uh, neutrino interaction uh, simulation and particle propagation, those we just run on CPU nodes, uh, and we try to saturate those CPUs. So in the case of Perlmutter, 128 cores, 256 threads, so we'll just spawn 256 tasks and use all the CPUs we can. And when it comes to running these GPU steps, those run as separate job submissions. Um, and in that case, we'll run four parallel processes since there are four GPUs, and we will not nearly make use of all the CPU resources available on those nodes. So we could co-schedule and use the CPUs on those nodes. That would make that be more efficient, but we're not doing that at this point. No, these, these are pretty loosely coupled. Um, so I, I knew a guy who worked at Dia Bay um, mm -hmm. a while ago. That I think did neutrino oscillations. Right? I worked on Dia Bay too. Oh, you did. Okay. So like, what's I guess improved since then? And they didn't have any sort of like live computation workflow like this, did they? Or did they? Uh, well, they, we did have um, data quality monitors and other tools that were hosted at NERSC on the portal. That was before Spin. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had services for data transfers that were hosted, I guess not at NERSC, but at LBL. But we did heavily use uh, first the old cluster PDSF, and then Edison, and then Corey for doing a lot of our data processing. Uh, and so, yeah, they were, they were great for us. Uh, we had basically our two centers were NERSC and uh, National Higher Energy Physics uh, um, in, in Beijing. And so here and there, we would do the same processing of our full data set. So all, all 
All the diet bay papers um, are based on data that was processed at NERSC. Oh, cool. Diet bay uh, operator based, correct? That was reactor based. Reactor -based. Yes. So you did not have the near and far detector, it was just one detector? It was, uh, we did have near and far relative to the reactor. So we had actually two near sites that were like a few hundred meters from the reactor and then far site a kilometer or two from the reactor. Oh, okay. So we did do some near far comparisons and that's how we got the result. But not nearly on the same, you know, hundreds of miles. Year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, I thought Fermilab is also shooting the three to, what is it, Sudbury? Yes, right. Um, that's in Canada, right? Yeah. So is that, is that related? Is that the same neutrino beam that gets split in two, or how does that work? So Dune will be using a beam that doesn't exist yet, but it oh. will. But um, yeah, so there are two beams running at Fermilab now. There's the booster beam uh, and the Numi beam. And so this two by two prototype will be running in the Numi beam. And I believe that that beam points toward this facility in South Dakota, and the other one might point toward Minnesota, I'm not sure on that. Um, but I don't think there are any operating neutrino experiments using the beam from Fermilab at the Minnesota facility. I think there might be uh, like, um, or, or, or the one in Canada, there might be some solar experiments there, but I don't think Fermilab. Yeah. I don't really work in the field, so I don't, don't keep up with Well, I do work in the field and I can't keep up with <laughs> all the experiments. Thank you so much. Thank you.